OK, we shouldn't, of course, forget about the fornicators. <laughs> um, OK, for those of you who think that this talk is going to be a lecture about uh, Donald Trump or Boris Johnson, uh, you, should, you should look away now. Uh, but it's actually a talk about, oops, it's a, oh, 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 oh. it's a talk about creatures who have no conscious knowledge that they're sending out false messages, uh, or they're cheating on their partners, or bullying those weaker than themselves. Well, perhaps that does uh, uh, fit Donald Trump at least rather well, I'm <laughs> kidding. Um, so uh, it's a strange thing. It's a, 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 the truth about beauty. Now, people are interested in beauty, and it's obviously it's a very important thing. The wonderful things have been written about it. Wonderful paintings have been made based on beauty. But what is beauty? Um, it, in some senses, beauty is truth, and truth beauty. That is all you know on earth and all you need to know. And that, of course, is key to old on a old on a Grecian urn. And it's a very beautiful line, but in fact, it probably isn't true. But one very common use of beauty is to see the handiwork of God in the works of nature. And you can see that again and again. There are dozens and dozens of websites. Nature declares God's glory in a universal language. And the fact that something is beautiful is somehow uh, defines the fact that there must be a very beautiful divine being um, arranging matters so that, so that should be so. Um, nature declares God looks glory, as, there, as, this, uh, as this piece here says. But that's actually very misleading, at least to biologists. Because to biologists, beneath every beauty lurks a beast. It may well be hidden away, but now and again, it'll show its uh, ugly side. And that's what I want to explore in this talk. Now, nobody can deny that much of nature is very beautiful. Um, and you can, nobody can deny that the theory of evolution is very beautiful. And this is the, uh, this is the last, famous last paragraph of The Origin of Species. Um, and the, from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. OK, that's the last line of The Origin of Species. The only time in The Origin, actually, that the word evolve appears, and the word evolution doesn't appear at all. So clearly, that's, uh, I have no problem at all with, decide, with, with Charles Darwin agreeing that many of the works of nature, physical and biological, are indeed beautiful. And you can see that uh, when, you, when you look around you. The beauties of nature, the beauties of flowers, for example, the beauties of butterflies, okay? uh, the beauties of birds, um, uh, and even the beauties of our fellow primates, apart from the Austrian on the bottom right. Okay? <laughs> But all those beauties are in some way either screams of sexual frustration, which many of them are, silent screams of passion in an attempt to attract a mate. They're screams of rage in an attempt to fight off <coughs> predators. Or they're screams of dishonesty when you pretend when you're, that you're dangerous or attractive when in fact you're not. So nature is basically lying to when it says that it's, uh, that it's beautiful. Um, it's a phenomenon of evolution. And I have to tell you with some pride that the last word has now been written on Darwin and on evolution. And I have to tell you with further pride that that last word was written by me, a book published last week, which is actually the Lady Bird Book of Evolution, <laughs> which summarizes the whole of Darwin's argument, the 170,000 words of the origin of species, in 5,200 words. That's a masterly piece of editing, and the pictures are nice, too. Um, it, hasn't, it hasn't sold nearly as many copies as, as uh, Prince Charles's book on uh, global warming, which I can kind of understand. But I'm most uh, miffed to find that it's sold even fewer copies than the third one in the series, which is the Lady Bird book of quantum mechanics. My god. <laughs> um, but still, so enough of, the, enough of the advertising. Now, Darwin knew um, that the only real disproof that a real disproof of his, of his theory would emerge if he ever found a creature that was acting solely for the benefit of another species. Um, he says that more or less bluntly. If he finds a creature that lives only to help another species, he, that could not have evolved. E evolution is fundamentally a selfish phenomenon, hence the famous selfish gene. Well, he has no reason to worry, because in spite of many claims that it's true, uh, it's never actually been true, found to be true at all. Under peace, there is always conflict. And under what seems stability and beauty is often a secret, a quiet war, which, is, which means that the whole system is poised on the edge 
of collapse. Now, we can illustrate that with a very famous and familiar analogy, which is the Red Queen hypothesis, which has been much used in biology, and I'm sure you're familiar with it. And it comes, of course, from Alice in Wonderland. Alice in Wonderland is, a, as we all know, is an extraordinary book. It's an extraordinary book, not only because it, uh, it's, a, it's a classic, wonderful classic of English literature, but also contains within itself many, many scientific themes in mathematics more than anything else, because uh, the Reverend Charles Dodgson was a mathematician. And rather in brackets, um, m many of its hallucinatory moments, such as uh, Alice growing or getting smaller or neck stretching, um, uh, w reflected the fact that, uh, that, uh, Lewis, that Lewis Carroll had migraine very severely and often saw things stretching or disappearing, or a big black blob appearing in front of his, in front of his eyes, the Cheshire cat, in other words, where only the, only, the, uh, only the smile was left. But that's neither here nor there. This is the famous, uh, this is the famous uh, race, the endless race, the Caucasus race, where they go around in circles, and Alice runs as hard as she can, um, and she runs like mad, and she's astonished to find that she stays in the same place. And that's been used again and again by biologists to illustrate what's called co-evolution, the interaction between two species as one tries to take advantage of, as they try to take advantage to, of each other and often invest a lot in taking that advantage, but in the end, they end up in the, sta in the same place, in a stable kind of equilibrium, even, sp even in spite of having um, uh, invested vast quantities of effort in trying to, uh, to fool and take advantage of their partner. Well, Darwin was um, very well aware of the problem. It was remembering that Darwin wrote 19 books all, all together, um, some of which are practically unreadable. There are four books on fossil barnacles. I do not, rec rec I do not particularly recommend them. Um, but the book after The Origin of Species, just three years after The Origin, actually summarized this particular issue of a co-evolutionary race with two combating partners, often generating most beautiful objects very uh, precisely. And this was Darwin's 1862 book, The Origin was 1859, on the various contrivances by which Britain, British and foreign orchids are fertilized by insects. Now, that was a classic of Darwinian writing because he, he solved yet another problem in a book and he went on to solve human evolution. I mean, he was an extraordinary genius. But Darwin was interested in orchids um, for many, many reasons, particularly because they're exquisitely adapted, or so it seems, uh, to their pollinators. And uh, orchids are, of course, plants. Uh, they're Many of them are simultaneously male and female. And Darwin already knew about sexual selection, the peacock's tail and so on. He knew that there was a battle among males in order to uh, defeat the male opposition and to attract the females, and a battle of a kind among females to choose the best, highest quality male. And he, he saw that when he talked, for example, about the peacock's tail. Now, that's also true in plants, except in plants, a third party is involved. Because if a, what a plant needs, it, from a plant's point of view, a bee, is a, a bee is a flying penis, okay? That's what it does. It comes flying in for its own selfish reasons to get a reward from the plant. And as it does, if it gets it, its reward, it picks up the pollen and delivers pollen at the same time and moves genes between plants, okay? Now, from the plant's point of view, what we need to have is a, a pollinator which is what the, pan, what the plant wants is a pollinator that's busy, hungry, and faithful. In other words, it's always at work. It doesn't get much of a reward, and it only comes for the same kind of plant every time. Uh, but from the pollinator's point of view, things are quite different. It wants to be, uh, it wants to be lazy, bloated, and promiscuous. That's what it really wants to do. It wants to have a good time, basically, and move from flit from flower to flower of different species, getting a big reward each time, um, and not having to do too much work. Now, we've got this classic tension between the two. And you can see that better than anything else, probably, um, in orchids. The contrivances by which orchids are fertilized are as varied and almost as perfect as any of the most beautiful adaptations in the animal kingdom. And Darwin was certainly right. And he talks uh, enormously about... Um, about the details of how they do it, but we're not going. We're not, I, I don't need to. Uh, I don't need to um, uh, go into the precise details. Um, here's a Victorian illustration of some orchids, and I think you'll agree they are the most astonishingly complicated and beautiful 
flowers. And they're very, very expensive um, and very hard to grow. Um, and a, a bunch of orchids is you know, a, an expensive gift to your potential mate. So in some senses, they play a part in our own reproductive lives as well. Um, so that's, uh, that, that, that's, that's the orchid. Um, they get their name, their, their Latin name is the Orchidaceae. Okay. And actually, that's the Orchidaceae is the same root as Orchidectomy. And they're named after their roots, which look exactly like testicles, um, which uh, actually, given their own sex lives, is actually rather, uh, rather appropriate. Okay. And we'll see later, there's a close tie between this battle between the two partners and the evolution of sex itself. Well, Darwin saw that um, they were an example of sexual selection. The uh, selection was on the botanical equivalent of the peacock's tail, as I had to say, uh, uh, as I've already said. And there are um, thousands and thousands of flowering plants, thousands and thousands of different pollinators, insects, um, kangaroos do it in Australia, bats do it quite frequently, um, even giraffes do it to some African acacia trees, moving pollen around. So it's a busy business, there's no question. And this is, as I said, this is a divergence in interest between the two parties. So as a result, there's a, the, 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 what seems like cooperation, pollinator and plant, is full of discord. Um, the, uh, the bunch of flowers is an, is an advertisement, a statement of a high-quality product from the, uh, from the insect's point of view, but like many advertisements, it overstates what it's going to offer, okay, as we'll see. Now, Darwin saw this precise convergence, this precise cooperation between different species of uh, plants and their pollinators, which is some, sometimes extraordinarily precise. And somebody once sent him from Madagascar a, uh, um, a particular flower called Angraecum, um, which, was, uh, which has a nectary a foot long. And he, spe he, he speculated that there must be in Madagascar a moth, and these things are, pollin are pollinated by moths, which had a tongue a foot long. Well, there's Darwin's orchid, and if you want to see Darwin's orchid, if you go to Down House in Kent, they're growing in the, uh, in the greenhouse there. Um, in, uh, I think it was 1992, finally the moth was discovered, and that's the pollinator. That's one of the very rare, one of the ve very rare um, well, I don't know, predictions you could make in, it's ever been made in biology and found to be correct. Um, and there's a race. The, 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 there's a constant tendency by the plant to increase the length of its uh, nectary, and this challenge the moth even further, and then the moth has to match that by increasing the length of its tongue until perhaps it gets to the physical limit, um, and you end up with this, uh, with this um, um, a very precise tie. However, if you make a family tree of orchids using DNA, um, which you can do, you just make a phylogeny, as we say, look at all the orchids and see who's related to what, um, and make a, make a sort of... A, make a sort of a, pattern of kinship of the orchids, and that's been extensively done in all plants, including orchids. And you do the same for the moths or for bees. It turns out they're not the same. So it turns out that what looks like stability uh, is not. Uh, these, these moths have shifted over evolutionary time from one species of, of plant to another. It doesn't happen very often, which is why we don't often see it, but it, does, it really doesn't happen. But Darwin realized that there was plenty of opportunity for cheating in this system. And he was baffled to find that some um, orchids did not give a did not give a uh, uh, did not give a reward, and he couldn't understand that at all. These were in southern England, these orchids, and uh, he, we just couldn't understand that. Um, and he called he called this this, this gigantic whoops this gigantic imposture as he as he called it. Um, he couldn't see how that. Uh, evolved, and he was so obsessed by this. He was so, uh, how could this way evolve? Um, and uh, he would spend a long time dissecting the orchids and grinding them up and seeing if a plant was eating a bit of orchid or eating the pollen. Nope, there was nothing there. What he didn't realize is how dishonest these things could be, because these were what we call mimics. These are orchids that do not give a reward and yet uh, look sufficiently attractive and like plants that do give a reward to bring pollinators in at no cost to themselves. And uh, um, there are many of them. For example, here's uh, three of them. The central species uh, tends to, is, is a real uh, 
nectar giver, the ones on either side are cheats. Okay, they look remarkably like the central one, and you tend to find that the uh, the the, uh, the mimics tend to uh, grow scattered among their hosts. Because if the frauds all grow together, then the insects very quickly learn that these things are frauds. So in other words, these these uh, these plants are a bit like um, a bit like fraudsters in the city of London um, tend to attack to attract them, attach themselves to different groups of companies, or in this case, uh, rewarding, rewarding orchids. Um, now, uh, about a th in fact, about a third of all orchids, wild orchids, act in this way. So there's plenty of underhand stuff uh, going on. They're, ma they're manipulating the behavior of their pollinators. And that, it turns out, is something which is very common in nature, that one party changes the behavior of the other party for its own advantage. And of course, mimicry of this kind is common in, in animals too. Um, there's a very familiar case, a stinging wasp and five harmless uh, um, it mimics. One's, some, some of them are surface flies. Um, so one of them on the bottom right is actually, is actually a beetle. But if you're flying along as a, as a bird and you've been stung by a wasp, you're going to avoid them all. But of course, that's a kind of indirect kind of parasitism, because if there are too many mimics, then the birds come flying along, and they might learn to associate, associate these uh, bright patterns with things which are tasty rather than the things which are dangerous, so that the dangerous ones get attacked more often. So this is a kind of parasitism with, with uh, an indirect kind, of, uh, indirect kind of parasitism. And there are lots and lots of examples of it. Here's a very bizarre one. It's a Peruvian bird who's nestling when it's little and small and tiny, and they're often attacked by predators, other birds that come in and pick off the nestlings. Um, it actually mimics a toxic caterpillar. It's only just been discovered a few weeks ago. And they've done experiments to show that it actually does. It works. So I've never seen a, I've never seen a, a bird that actually um, mimics a caterpillar before. But these are everywhere. And there are some famous examples of them. If you travel in Africa, I once did some work on these things. Um, these, uh, this, is a, this is a butterfly that's called Papilio uh, Dardanus, and if you look at those um, at those butterflies, if you look at the ones on the right, the, the three the two, there's two groups of two groups of six. Uh, on the left hand group, there's some brownish ones on the right, and on the right hand group, there's some blackish ones on the right. Every one of the smaller individuals is a different species of butterfly. They're totally distinct from each other. They're in different genera. They're not related. They don't mate with each other, and they look different. The other six, the ones on the left. In the, the slightly larger ones are all the same species of butterfly, the Peliodarus, um, which have evolved to mimic different species of the poisonous ones. And of course, therefore, they're putting, a, they're uh, forcing the poisonous ones to pay a price. When the poisonous ones are very abundant and the mimics are rare, then mimicry is perfect. When the mimics are very abundant and the poisonous ones are rare, then mimicry breaks down. So it's a kind of, it's kind of a, um, a, a dynamic um, thing. I had a, a friend of mine. Um, years ago, who wanted to know how poisonous these butterflies were. Um, and he'd seen them in Africa, um, the birds would eat the model and immediately throw up. So he decided to eat one. I think he was actually at Liverpool. And uh, he actually thought he'd better check with the, med the medics first. And it turned out the amount of poison in these models, they're called cardiac glycosides, and they're actually got from plants, is enough to kill five people if you eat one of them. So I don't recommend it. Uh, next, next time you're in Africa and you feel like eating a butterfly, make sure it's a mimic rather than a model. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a, um, it's kind of a, uh, an interesting and fascinating uh, thing. And once again, it's a matter of the uh, mimic. Um, uh, uh, manipulating the behavior of the predators, a uh, behavioral change. And there's some examples of what we call aggressive mimicry, too. Here's cuckoos, well-known example of mimicry. But actually, cuckoos themselves, um, and there are many uh, cuckoo-like birds across the, across the world, the familiar uh, British cuckoo, but also plenty in Africa, a t totally different group in, uh, in the Americas. They actually themselves are mimics. They look like predators. They look like hawks. Like sparrow hawks or other kinds of hawks. Uh, they're not. They generally eat insects. But what they do is they, ter they terrorize uh, small birds because they look like hawks. The small birds then leave their nests. And of course, then the real, then the real parasitism comes in when the, um, when the, um, the uh, cuckoo zooms in and dumps, uh, throws out, throws out the, uh, uh, one of, at least one of the eggs of the, uh, ho of the host species and dumps its own egg. And I don't know if you've ever seen the bits of film which are occasionally shown on television. They come in, 
throw out an egg and dump their own egg within two or three seconds. It's uh, quite, a, quite a, a remarkable piece of behavior. And of course, what happens then is that, um, that uh, uh, it, it, it lays its egg in another species in another species' nest. And we get, just like the butterflies, we get races of cuckoos that specialize on different models. Um, here we have Greek, a reed warbler on the left there. Um, and you, the, the black arrows are the cuckoo's eggs. And you can see how perfectly they match the eggs of their, of their, um, of their targets. And they're always slightly larger, but the birds don't seem to, don't seem to notice that. Um, and of course, what happens is that the cuckoo's egg grows more quickly and hatches earlier than the other ones. Uh, then we have the hatch, the, um, the cuckoo chick, which has got a little uh, backpack on its back in which it can gra grab the other eggs or even the other, or even the other uh, chicks of the native species and throw them out. And then it grows to be this enormous cuckoo in the nest, um, which the poor parent um, uh, sees as a bunch of its own offspring. And it does that. Because if you take the song of a particular uh, model bird, a reed warbler in this case, and you record it, you can say it's a, it goes cheap, cheap, something like that. I'm not, not very good at doing reed warblers. Uh, but if you do the whole brood of reed warblers, six or seven of them at once, you get this constant cheeping. If you then get the cuckoo chick, it makes the same noise as a whole brood of reed warblers. And the poor old, uh, the poor old. Uh, uh, um, parent thinks it's not one big bird, but six of its own small birds, um, and so it feeds it. And that's what we call a super stimulus. Okay, that's an exaggerated that's an exaggerated form of a particular thing. And again, it's a, it's a battle between between the two. Um, the stimulus is super. It's a dishonest advertisement. Now, there's an arms race here. Some species of bird can identify cuckoo's eggs and throw th them out always, so they don't get parasitized very much. Others do it sometimes, um, but not always, and others can't do it at all. So clearly, this is a dynamic process like all the others. There's a very strange and rather, rather telling example of altering, of altering um, the uh, behavior of a host, which is this creature here. Um, Talking, getting, getting, moving towards the fornicators now. Okay, um, this is a this is a, a crustacean, a thing like a small barnacle or crab, which is Latin name is Sacculina, and what Sacculina is, is a parasite on other crabs. And my God, does it change its host's behavior? That uh, thing with an arrow is actually called the externa. It's part of the Sacculina. And the Sacculina itself doesn't look anything like a crab or a barnacle. It hasn't got a shell. But what actually happens is that a, a, a female Sacculina gets onto a crab, a male crab, bores its way into it, gets in there, and starts growing through the whole tissue mass of the crab until really it's, uh, it's, um, it's taken up a large part of the crab's body. And it leaves a bit of its own body, in fact, its own, its own egg mass, outside the crab's body in exactly the same way as a female crab would put her own egg mass when she lays eggs. Okay. But uh, then a male cyclona comes along, fertilizes the female parasite, and the, together they, they feminize the male. They castrate it. They, make it uh, they switch on hormones that cause the male crab to become female. Okay. So that's hard luck on the male crab. It even does female mating dances, which is almost, perhaps rather embarrassing for the male crab. Um, but as the process goes on, the sacculina, the parasite, releases its own eggs into the water. And female crabs, when they release their own eggs, have an interesting piece of behavior. They release them one at a time, and then they wave them off to give, you know, in the water. They wave them off to give them a chance, or a better chance of staying alive, rather than one small mass of uh, crab larvae. Well, the sacculina does that, and the crab, the parasitized crab, does that very complicated piece of behavior. But what it's doing is taking its parasites um, uh, larvae and waving them off. So its entire brain has really been taken over by the uh, existence of this parasite. So the question arises really, do we have anything similar in our own parasitic history? And the answer is yes. Now I'm, I'm rather embarrassed about talking about this because I know we have at least one distinguished parasitologist in the, um, in the audience. But I was a uh, I was on In Our Time with Melvin Bragg on Thursday. And I got away with talking about it then, so I think I can probably get away with talking about it now. Um, Melvin looked completely disgusting when we discussed, disgusted when we, to, when we told this story. It's, um, it's a parasite 
called uh, toxoplasma. And it's a thing which is very, it's a very common, uh, it's a single cell parasite, and it's a very common behavior pattern among parasites to have more than one host. Some of them have whole, whole chains of hosts, but this one has got effectively two hosts. It's got a mammal, um, a cat in this case, uh, in which is its, its primary host, where it has sex and produces its own offspring, which are then excreted by the cat, and it's got a secondary host, which, generally speaking, is a mouse. Okay. Now, mice live in a world of smell. Anybody who's ever kept mice or been into a mouse laboratory will know immediately uh, that mice live in a world of smell because they stink. But they have, they have a very, very sophisticated apparatus for identifying their kin, their, their animals from different populations, predators. And if a mouse uh, smells cat urine, it will immediately think, good God, I'm not sitting around here, and it run away as fast as it can. Unless, that is, it has been infected by this toxoplasma, which gets into the mouse brain and forces the, persuades the mouse that the most delicious perfume in the world is, in fact, the smell of cat urine. So what it does, it sniffs this urine and says, oh, that's mar a marvelous perfume. And it rushes up the stream of urine until it finds the cat and nemesis is eaten by the cat, is then eaten by the mouse, um, and the cat is eaten by the mouse, or vice versa, as the case may be. Uh, the mouse is then eaten by the cat, and the process goes on. But the problem is, and I can tell you this is a very real problem, that humans themselves sometimes, often, get infected by this particular uh, parasite. It's, uh, they're, they're, they're not, uh, they, they, they don't really play a part in its chain, but on, incidentally, they get infected. About one person in three in the UK has been infected at one time or another. More than that in France, which I find oddly comforting. And <laughs> now, um, usually there are no obvious symptoms, although there is certainly a condition called toxoplasmosis, which is dangerous for pregnant women or people with, uh, with uh, deficient immune systems, but most people are not aware that they've been infected. However, there's been a lot of controversy about this, but I think the recent literature has it, it makes it really quite, um, quite clear um, that what happens is when it gets in, if you look at the bottom left there, you've got a cyst of the toxoplasma in a mouse brain. It's also in human brains when it gets in. And there's this quite a strong, in fact, a very strong um, fit between uh, symptoms of mental disorder, such as, such as schizophrenia, depression, and suicide, and the presence of toxoplasma, of, of toxoplasma in the brain. So it's having something, it's doing something to the human personality. Um, and uh, the effect is, is statistical, but it's, I think is strong. There's an even more startling statistic, which has been put around quite extensively, it, which has to do with motor accidents. And, what, uh, and there's a recent paper about quite a large survey that was carried out in Prague, which took people who'd been in car crashes, they'd crashed their cars, a large group of them, uh, compared to another control group of people who drove and had not crashed their cars. And there was an incidence of toxoplasma of almost three times higher in those who'd crashed their cars into other cars or stationary objects um, uh, that compared to those who didn't have toxoplasma. So just as in the mouse, this pushes you towards high-risk behavior. So there you've got the, um, uh, there you've got the, uh, uh, the uh, manipulation of human behavior, too, by a particular, uh, by a particular cheap, uh, cheat and, uh, and, para and, uh, and uh, parasites. Well, let's, let's get to the interesting stuff which is the fornicators, okay? All right, let's get the fornicators. Now, the biggest question in biology, there are, th there are two related questions. The big, high-impact question in biology, which has not been answered, is what is the point of males, okay? Why do we bother with sex? Sex is incredibly expensive um, in many senses, uh, the biologically, socially, uh, in terms of embarrassment. Um, and uh, uh, males are basically parasites on females, to put it crudely. What they do is they persuade the females to copy their male genes with either no input apart from a few sperm or very little, or rather little input in terms of childcare and that kind of stuff. So how, why are males so damn persistent? How do they, where do they come from and where do they, uh, what, why do they persist? It's actually a subset of this story about the interaction, as in pollinators and orchids, the interaction between two parties with different interests. And indeed, sex, many people argue, originated with parasitism itself. Now, there are plenty of cases where you can grow uh, plants and animals without males. Um, uh, a classic case in, when it comes to, um, 
to crop plants is the banana, which in spite of its uh, interesting shape is in fact entirely asexual and all, all female. And in fact, all the bananas you see in all the shops in Europe belong to the same clone. It's called the Cavendish clone. Um, and in fact, I can tell you, and I'll come back to this in a moment, uh, get eat your bananas while you can, uh, because the Cavendish clone is rapidly going extinct, because they're all being attacked by various tropical diseases, and they're all the same. Um, and uh, they, they, the, 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 it's, a, it's, a, being, it's a risky tactic. tactic. Um, now, the most striking case of co-evolution between parasitic hosts that we know, which is also associated with the origin of sex, very much so, has to do with the potato, okay? Now the potato, um, there we have it, the potato. And we tend to forget how novel a crop the potato is. Uh, the potato came across, the potato of course is a new world plant, it's, a, it's host races are mainly in the Andes, kept huge populations to South Americans arrive alive. It's an extraordinarily uh, nourishing plant. Um, you can live perfectly well just on potatoes and perhaps a little bit of milk as well. Uh, it's got more vitamin C in a big spud than in a lemon. Um, so, you know, it's the ideal plant and people grew it. Uh, it wasn't at all popular in Europe. It came across in the 16th century to Spain together with the gold of the Indies, but the, uh, the church didn't like it. Um, because it's not mentioned in the Bible, and it grows, it grows uh, rather dangerously close to the devil because it grows on the ground, so it was used as a medicine. Uh, there's a very strange line in Falstaff's Merry Wives of Windsor, when Falstaff, who quite wrongly believes he's persuaded two women to share his bed, and he comes out with a line that has long baffled um, long baffled Shakespearean, Shakespearean scholars, he looks up to the firmament and he says, let the sky rain potatoes. And many learned articles have been written about what he means. But in fact, potatoes were thought to be an aphrodisiac in those days, hard though it is to believe. I have to say I've eaten plenty of chips um, with, <laughs> uh, with no apparent result. Um, but, but they were, they, they transformed the European economy from the, French, from the French Revolution onwards. And the French Revolution was actually was actually quite important in, uh, in, in bringing potatoes in. And they particularly, of course, transformed the Irish economy. Until in 1848, or a bit before, there was the potato, there was in the 18, late 1840s, early 1850s, what was called the potato blight appeared. Now, by that time, the poor, the Catholic side of Ireland, uh, was really addicted to the potato. A family of eight could live on a, an acre of land, which isn't very much, um, and uh, on only potatoes and a single cow. They would stay healthy on that boring but adequate diet. And so the population of Ireland ex exploded. As you can see, in the, in the, from 1500 onwards, uh, when the potatoes came in in about 1780, and you can see a rocketing up of, of, uh, a rocketing up of the Irish population. But then came the potato blight. And nobody knew what this was. It was, seemed to be something which had come out of nowhere. But in fact, what it is was a single clone of a, uh, uh, it's not actually a fungus, but it looks like a fungus. It's called Phytophthora infestans, OK? The, the, infesti the, in, the, in, the invading plant killer. And in South America, it's there. But in South, um, and it, it, had a, it had a huge effect. You can see the population of Ireland crashed. It still hasn't got back to the level which it was at the time of the potato blight. And if you go to Ireland, of course, as you will be well aware, uh, in many parts of Ireland there are deserted villages as a result of this enormous disaster. And actually, it's a classic of the interaction between parasite and host. Because in Ireland and across much of uh, Europe, only one clone of potatoes was being grown just like the bananas today, they were all genetically identical to each other. Probably billions of potatoes. In Ireland, they were called the lumpers because they were big, lumpy potatoes, very productive. Okay? Um, and that was fine until you got a parasite that could actually mimic the um, defenses, the internal defense of the potato against, uh, against infection. So what the, what the potato is basically doing is saying to saying to other parasites, you can't get into me. I've got a kind of immune system that you can't circumvent. But once you get a parasite, as you inevitably will, in which a genetic change, or perhaps a, a migra from somewhere else, has got a new form of uh, virulence gene, then it's going to get in there, and it's going to kill everything. And that's what exactly what happened in the, uh, in the, potato, in the potato blight. Now, 
Of course, the potato in South America is a sexual plant. It has flowers, they pollinate each other, and there are many, many varieties. In Europe, it wasn't. In Europe, people used to should take seed potatoes, as they call them, cut them up, and just put, plant, the, plant the lumps, and then they grow another copy of what was there before. So if you go to South America, you find um, these native varieties of potatoes. And there are hundreds of them, literally hundreds of them. And each one looks different, they taste different. Some of the, uh, the South American native peoples still use them, much less than they used to. But now there's a bank, a potato bank, in Lima, in Peru, where they grow these things, because within these lines there are genes which give resistance to different forms of this infestive um, parasite. And uh, every year now, or every couple of years, what happens is um, that the potatoes in Europe are, uh, are uh, the place in Holland, appropriately enough, in Wageningen, in the uh, Agricultural University, which every year, about this time of year, a bit later, scans the potatoes of Europe, and there are billions of potatoes in Europe, billions more in India and China, which are now the biggest growers of potatoes in the world, and asks what resistance, what susceptibility genes are present in this year's crop, genes that make them liable to attack by these mimics, these, uh, these fungus-like things, and, um, and adds new ones to protect the, uh, protect the potato in every year. Here we've got a rather complicated diagram. But what you can see is that in 1845, uh, there was only one form of the, uh, of the uh, parasite in, in Europe. Um, and uh, that was the time, that lasted until 1875. And so there was just one form of the parasite which could attack the one form of the, of the, um, of the, um, of the, um, uh, uh, of the potato. And that lasted more or less until 1978. There'd be one form of the parasite that would be t replaced after a couple of years by another form, another form. And you could, when it was done professionally, all they did was change the form in all the potatoes of Europe once a year. And that was fine. It seemed to work. Until 1977. And in 1977, sex raised its ugly head because uh, 1976, you may remember, there was a very, very dry year, which meant that the potato crop across Europe largely failed. And so what, uh, what European importers did was to bring in Ameri American potatoes from a source which they had not used before, and that was Mexico. Mexico grows lots of potatoes. And for reasons which you simply not understood, the, uh, the phytophthora, the, in the infestive um, uh, parasite, is sexual in Mexico and not in the Andes. So what happened was, without them realizing it, before 1978, they'd had an asexual parasite and an asexual host. In 1978, they brought in sex, OK? And in fact, sex first appeared in Scandinavia, appropriately enough, uh, where, they went, uh, where they'd brought in all the potatoes from Mexico. And that began to roar through. The sexual reproduction began to roar through the, the parasite population. And that made evolution move much, much faster. Because once you've got sex, you're basically doing what we call recombining. You're getting new mixtures of genes every generation. It's like playing poker. If you always play poker with the same hand, and I don't play poker, so that probably isn't an appropriate analogy. But if you always get um, uh, three aces and a king, in your hand, you're going to win nearly every time against somebody who shuffles their hand every time. But one time, they're going to get four aces, and then you're going to lose. And with sex, you do that. You're constantly shuffling the cards. And once that had happened, you can see the, the rate at which um, the, the shuffling of the potato clones greatly increased. Uh, in 2008, there was a very, very powerful attack, which they had to move lots and lots of, um, of uh, uh, the blue section resistances in order to fight it. But now this is very carefully controlled. But it's still poised on the edge. It's still poised on the edge very much of another, of another um, potato, uh, dangers of another potato blight. And in fact, sex and disease and parasitism are closely related. And it's often suggested that this might, they might be so closely related that this kind of parasitism, this kind of, of cheating, was at the origin of sex itself. I'm now going to tell you a tragic story from my point of view. Uh, this is the jolly London suburb, not yet filled with intellectuals and hippies, of Thamesmead. Okay? And Thamesmead was built, as you can tell, in the 1970s on a swamp. Um, and uh, it's not the world's most charming place. It's not as bad as it looks, but it's not the most, world's most charming place by any means. It's very hard to get to. Um, and 
Tenth Fleet is built on an interesting swamp because it was one of the anchorage points of, in the 19th century of ships going up the Thames. They'd drop out to anchor in the Thames, just off Thamesmead, uh, before they went up to the docks, St. Catharines and so on, uh, in order to be unloaded. And in 1878, a ship came from New Zealand. And it came back empty from New Zealand, having taken some stuff to New Zealand. It had a lot of ballast, big stones, uh, from New Zealand in its, uh, in its uh, hold. And so they threw these, this ballast into the, into the Thames. And um, on it was a little snail, something about that big. I knew I'd get snails in somewhere here. Um, something about that big. It's called Potimopergus um, uh, Jenkins eyes, or it actually it's changed its name as Potimopergus antipodorum now. And uh, it got in there, and if you go to any freshwater um, in Europe, and, and brackish waters too, you'll find billions of these snails, billions of them. Uh, in a good place, you can put in a net, dig them out, and you'll get 150, 200 in a net. They're everywhere. They have come from New Zealand, and they just spread across all the rivers and lakes of Europe without doing much harm that we can see, but we don't know much about um, river and lake biology. And years ago, myself and some colleagues did a bit of rather primitive molecular biology on them. Um, uh, 19, 19, in 1984. God, was as long ago as that. Um, and it, they were always sold as being clones. They're all female. There are no males. We found one male with a penis, one animal with a penis, in the, in a, in the moat of Harlech Castle in North Wales. That's the only one we ever found. Whether it was a mutant, I don't know. But all the others were female. So we thought, well, let's look at the genetics of this. So we ground these guys up, and we discovered there were three clones, A, B, and C, we called them. And in brackish places, there were three. In, in, in not very brackish places, there were two lived together, and in freshwater, there was only one. So we, plumped, we, we, um, we published that paper in that high in that high-profile journal, the Journal of Molluscan Studies. Um, didn't seem to have changed its, uh, my career very much. Having, on the other hand, I've published numbers of papers in both nature and science, and they haven't changed my career either. So, um, <laughs> but, uh, and we thought no more about it. Um, and we were incredibly stupid. Look, we just looked back and gasped, because somebody else, I think quite independently, to be, to, be, to be frank, had the obvious idea of going to New Zealand, where these things come from, and ask what goes on there. And it turned out that this guy, Curtis Lively, who's a nice guy, even though I'd like to strangle him, um, <laughs> it turns out that there's a, that there's a absolutely diagrammatic fit between parasitism and sex. Now, this, sna this snail lives in, you know, scenic New Zealand, OK? <laughs> That's New Zealand, scenic, Lord of the Rings, all that kind of stuff. I was there a couple of years ago. Um, um, the, uh, the, the, the pilot said, uh, now put your clocks back by 12 hours and 22 years. My God, he was right. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but New Zealand, very, very beautiful place indeed, no question of that. Um, and these animals live in lakes, OK, and in rivers, but in lakes. And they live either in high, icy lakes, um, or they live in lowland lakes with lots of ducks on them. Okay. There are also lots of parasites, as there often are in lakes, things called trematodes. Um, and there's an absolutely linear fit between the presence of parasites and the presence of males. If you go to a high and icy lake where it's too cold for the parasites to complete their life cycle within a year, then there are no males. There's a life cycle. It's quite a simple life cycle. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the, so the ducks eat the, uh, the, ducks eat, ducks eat the uh, snails. Uh, they, they poo out the eggs, which then infect the snails. So it's straightforward. Okay. Uh, but there's a striking fit between the proportion of the parasites, effectively zero in a very high lake, and the proportion of males. There's the proportion of males in the population, up to 40%, proportion of the animals that are parasitized, an absolutely linear fit between the two. So the more, male, the more parasites, the more males. So you've got, with parasites, you've got this evolutionary race going on, so you need this expensive luxury known as males who will shuffle the cards for the females. Okay, we're kind of the croupiers of the biological world, with, um, and uh, we do the card shuffling and keep up with the parasites. It's even true on a much smaller scale, because if you go to a, a deep lake down below, it turns out that the um, males only exist in the shallow water as far down as the, as the ducks can dive. Below the level at which the ducks can dive, there's no males, because the ducks don't eat the 
snails, and you don't need any males. So that's kind of a, a beautiful example of, um, of the evolution of sex under the pressure of cheats and liars, of parasites. Okay. But once you've got the evolution of sex, once you've got the fornicators, everything speeds up. And you get all this... All these phenomena appear within particular species, exaggerated signals, changes of behavior, um, taking advantage of the other partner, all this stuff. And I'll just talk a little bit about that. Okay. But let's talk about the, we talked about the mimics, okay, che the cheats. You tend to think in, uh, if you watch David Attenborough films, and actually David Attenborough films are more sophisticated than that, but if you watch you know, early nature study films, uh, one tended to think that if you saw red deer fighting on the Isle of Rum, uh, big hairy red deer bashing each other like mad, one, deer, one male would win, and one assumed that, um, that uh, the other male wouldn't have any sexual success. And he particularly assumed that, um, that the, the males who didn't even bother to take part in the fight would have no sexual success. Well, we were completely wrong because with the advent of DNA probes and paternity testing, it became clear that there was another strategy. Not There was the fighting strategy, but there was something which is, the technical name is the SFC, and I explained to my students I have to use technical language in this field. It's called the sneaky fucker strategy. <laughs> um, the Islamic students always look a bit shocked. Um, and the sneaky, sneaky fucker, fucker strategy brings great joy to my heart because it means even if you go to the library all the time, uh, if you sit quietly and watch these big hairy fools making, uh, making, making a spectacle of themselves and fighting, then you can sneak in, mate, and sneak out again. And that turns out to be uh, a, um, a, a quite a successful, uh, quite a successful uh, um, uh, approach. There's a very recent paper, which is quite amazing about sneaky fuckering. These are, these are uh, shorebirds called ruffs, okay? And uh, they're remarkable, but it's now rare, unfortunately, in Britain, but you know, I've, seen, I've, seen one, so I've seen them once. And here are two males. There are two forms of male. Well, there were thought to be two forms of male, okay? There's one which has got a big black ruff, and they live on the seashore, these things, and one which has a, a more of a white ruff, and they fight over females, and they have quite vicious fights. And you've got this kind of uneasy equilibrium between them, generally the black males win in the fights. Um, but they're so exhausted by having won, they think, oh, God. And the white one then rushes in and does a bit of SFCing. And so the thing lives quite, it's quite stable. But just last year, it was discovered that there's a third form of male. And this is from the Ladybird book, OK? And the, <laughs> the third sex, as you might call it, is a male at the bottom there that looks exactly like a female. Okay, um, you can't tell them apart without dissecting them. And what happens is that this m female mimic just s saunters in to this fighting arena, um, saunters up to the female, winks at the female, mates with the female, and flies away again. And it's a perfectly successful strategy. So that's an extraordinary case of mimicry and cheating, where you actually cheat by taking up the sexual identity of somebody else, of something else. The other thing which happens, which is a parallel to the world of cheating outside, we've seen a bit of these super stimuli, you know, these, these, uh, enormous, bird, these enormous cuckoos and that kind of stuff. You get just the same, of course, in uh, sexual behavior. Um, you get, for example, what we call receiver bias. Uh, for some reason that we don't understand, when it comes to um, uh, choosing a mate, females prefer to have uh, an animal with an enormous horns or bright colors which show its which show its uh, which show the male's ability allegedly and that show the excellence of the male's genes but why do they like big horns or bright colors or why don't they like you know or, or peacock's tails are these things arbitrary I and mean, we don't really know but there do seem to be some inbuilt tendencies among both males and females to go for super stimuli okay this is an interesting example two species of fish closely related they can hybridize in the lab are actually widely used in cancer research. One's called the freshwater fish. One's called the sword tail for an obvious reason. The males have got an enormous tail. Okay? The other is called the platy fish, which is a close relative, but doesn't, the males don't have an enormous tail. And understandably, if you take, take the, top, the top square there, if you take the, uh, if you take the sword tail um, um, and uh, you give the females a choice of going to a male with or without a sword, you cut off the sword, 
or the male, then the females will always go for the male with the sword. That's fine. I mean, it's going for the big, healthy-looking one, right? But the thing which is much more bizarre on the right there, the right, bottom right square, that's when you do the experiment with the platyfish, which doesn't have a sword. If you attach a sword to a male platyfish, the female thinks, whoopee, and goes straight for that fish. So somehow that super stimuli is embedded, that stimulus is embedded in the female's brain. Where it comes from, we don't know. There's a famous and notorious example of the same thing happening in, in males, where they're att att attracted to particularly attractive females, showing their quality. These are things called Australian jewel beetles. Um, the Australian jewel beetle, big beetle, common in Australia. Um, both males and females are brown, but the female's very, very shiny. And the males fight over who gets the shiniest female. Now, of course, in Australia, uh, with the coming of the white man, there was a great change in the ecosystem, largely because they threw away their beer bottles. Okay? And here we have a stubby, an empty beer bottle. She's brown in Australia. They throw them away. If you drive down the highway in Australia, you'll see beer bottles on the side of the road everywhere. And most of them have got six males trying to copulate with it. Okay? <laughs> because they think this is a super attractive female. My God. So alcohol does work after all. <laughs> okay. um, so that again is a um, is a, is a strange uh, a strange spin on um, on uh, the, the sex and fornication story. Let me just end up briefly by talking a little bit about sexuality in primates. And I think I genuinely think it's a big mistake. It's stupid to draw parallels between modern society and other animals. Like, you know, we're the animal, we, we, you know, we, we've stepped outside the imperatives of evolution. But we can make some guesses about what life might have been in the past. There's no question at all that, um, that, uh, that there's um, uh, a lot of sexual selections, we call it, among our relatives, among gor in gorillas and chimps. And it's of two different kinds. There's what we call pre-copulatory Select, sexual selection and post-copulatory. And pre-copulatory sexual selection is the kind which uh, red deer do. They fight like mad, and the strong animal wins. And that's true in the gorilla, OK? That's the gorilla, the, ma the big male gorillas, the big silverbacks. In the fights, they win. Uh, gorillas, I have to tell you, have got embarrassingly small testicles, OK? Because um, so, they don't have to flood out the sperm of a predecessor because they've beaten the predecessor, the potential predecessor, into a pulp before um, be, uh, and mon monopolized all the females. Okay, so that's a gorilla, but the the uh, but uh, chimpanzees aren't like that. Chimpanzees certainly fight over females, but the difference in size between males and females is much less. Um, and sometimes they, the one male wins, sometimes the next male wins. So what they do, um, they put a lot of uh, em they put a lot of uh, uh, effort into. Um, into their testes, as you can see here, um, and use, generate vast quantities of sperm, which then hopefully will flood out any sperm from a, pre from a previous male by post-copulation, post-copulatory sexual selection. So where do we fit in all that? Well, it, when it comes to testes, I have to say the news is not that good. Um, um, and it's pretty clear that when you uh, look at the differences between men and women, males and females, uh, if there has been any sexual selection in human history, it's been much milder than in uh, chimps and gorillas. The difference in height of men and women, it's there, but it's small. Um, the, uh, there isn't a huge uh, investment in large testes and that kind of stuff, so it may have been there. Uh, there's a very strange spin, which I talked about here before, uh, which suggests that something quite dramatic happened in human evolution, because if we look... Oh, bugger. Oh, no, I, didn't, I lost the slide. If we look at the penises of all our relatives, the penises of all other primates have got spines on them. Uh, and the spines are there, and they're quite large spines, which are, and they're there to hold the female in, pri in place after copulation in the hope that the sperm of the successful male will succeed in doing it, in, getting, in doing the job. Humans are the only primate that doesn't have, uh, doesn't have uh, uh, spines on its penis, which may or may not be a good idea. Um, good news. Okay. There is one strange spin. If you look at swimming speeds in sperm, um, chimp sperm are a kind of Olympic swimmers. They go like mad. Gorilla sperm are very slow swimmers um, because it's not sperm competition. It's fighting that does the job. And humans are a little bit faster than gorillas, a lot less fast than chimps. So maybe a hint that something was going on. Now, 
I, I think we need to, that doesn't tell us much about the modern world, I don't think. It's clearly the case that we no longer live in the kind of world where some males have huge, so some men have huge amounts of sexual success, which means that other men don't. Okay? But we can look back at the history of sex in, human, in humans by looking at the comparing the distribution of genes on the male chromosome, the Y chromosome across the world, compared to the distribution of genes that go through both males and females. And you get some interesting patterns. I'm sure you, uh, what you can do is you can make a family tree based on DNA of the relatedness of different kinds of Y chromosome. And in this room, we'll have lots of different Y chromosomes, most of which will be fairly different from each other. Um, um, there will be lots of different kinds in this room, more than likely. But in one part of the world, vast numbers of males, in fact, tens or scores or hundreds of millions of men, share an identical Y chromosome. That's that, uh, that's that star cluster, as it's called, with a few minor variants that may have arisen by mutation. And you may well know this story, but this almost certainly marks the... Um, the uh, Y chromosome of Genghis Khan. Uh, Genghis Khan, who brought the Mongol, who set up the Mongol Empire, and Kublai Khan and all his male descendants, they were famous for being, put it bluntly, mass rapists. So their Y chromosomes became extremely abundant, and the footprint, if that's the word, of the the footprint of the um, of the um, of his, micro, or his Y chromosome is still there. Now, that's one unique historical moment. But interest, interestingly enough, there he is, looking rather smug, I would say, wouldn't you? Um, interestingly enough, if you do the same thing in Europe, you get the same pattern. What we've got here is the relative numbers of different kinds of Y chromosome across, the, across Europe. And you'll see, look at the vertical axis, that's the number of Y chromosomes of a particular identity, a kind of male surname. And you, it's, the, the figures go, it's a logarithmic scale, 1, 10, 100, 500, 1,000. And a very few Y chromosomes, even in Europe, are very, very abundant. And if you go to the right there, and we don't go far enough to the right, but you'll find lots and lots of Y chromosomes are very rare. So that even in Europe, in historical times, how far back we don't know, there were some males that had massive sexual success or considerable sexual success and many other males who, didn't, who had no sexual or very little sexual success. So we can see that in the same, we can see the same history in, uh, in our own continent as in Europe, as in Asia. So I think the take-home lesson is that, you know, the cheats, liars and fornicators are everywhere. What are we going to do about it? Okay. Well, there's a, let me complete the, um, let me complete the, um, a quote from Alice in Wonderland. Now here you see it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. And if you wish to go anywhere, you must run twice as fast. And in this era of Donald Trump and Boris Johnson, we should better get running as soon as we possibly can. I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you.